All right, so we're we're live. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just look to make sure or see if we have any homeworks to do because uh, I can't remember. Project, yeah, that sounds about right. So there was the Ludum Dare uh, project uh, homework, and then. Project update one is due on Friday, uh, or not Friday, but Sunday. <clears throat> so go ahead and uh, uh, talk about what you've done so far on your project and put some artifacts showing the work that you've done, either using the tool you're using at the time, or uh, we just kind of want to get a, a feel for the progress. All right, and then just as a reminder <coughs> that for uh, just for one update, and there's three updates, you could also participate in a game jam. So if you're wanting to get more game programming experience, then you can go ahead and do that. All right, so that is what's due uh, this coming week. And then a week from today is the midterm and <coughs> uh, it'll basically include all the material up until today's lecture. And I'll have the slides up there, uh, uploaded in just a little while. Okay, so today <coughs> we are going to talk about uh, shading. So let me uh, hide everything here. Okay, so uh, shading, part two. All right, this is uh, last time, just by way of review, uh, we were talking about the different kinds of rendering methods, so ray tracing and rasterization. And we also talked about Uber shaders and G buffers, what's kind of the minimum um, uh, <coughs> items that we need to calculate so we can then go through the lighting uh, calculation. And then of course the Uber shader is essentially, uh, rather than separating your render pass into, or <coughs> your render passes into a bunch of little uh, disjoint shaders, you know, maybe one's just for bump mapping or one is just for uh, um, uh, uh, diffuse rendering or, you know, all these little tiny shaders. You can just do everything in one big shader and use branching to control how that one shader works. So uh, Uber shaders are, <coughs> in fact, for most, I guess, regular uh, scenarios, you could just use an Uber shader and you don't even need to use deferred shading. Uh, but we'll be getting into deferred shading a little bit uh, on Monday when we start talking about how do you actually like implement this in practice. Okay, so we'll be talking about render to texture and uh, edge rendering and a few other items there. So today, uh, after we review what we talked about last week, we're gonna start to talk about <laughs> different BRDFs. And so does anybody remember what the term BRDF stands for? This one you should be burning in your brain, like, so that it never, never leaves you. What does BRDF stand for? It's probably like one of those foot stomp that's going to be on the exam kind of questions. BRDF. It's okay to partially guess too, like. <laughs> right? <laughs> what what's specifically about lighting? How it off the okay, so reflect is part of one word in there. Reflect is part of a word. <coughs> it's like playing hangman here. We're <laughs> we got the reflect part or right, what else? Function, yeah. Uh, function. Yeah. Okay. Great. So it's a some function has to do with the idea of, of reflect. What else? Diffusion. Um, <coughs> uh, no, not not diffusion. It's got a di sound in there, but not diffusion. What are, maybe what are some other things to remember about it? Does it just go one way? No. How does it go then? It integrates all the light coming into and out of the surface. <laughs> okay. Into and out of a surface. <laughs> it's not directional, it's... Not just directional, but what? Pro 
put my duet in front of that word to make it sound like it's two ways. Bidirectional, all right? So this is the bidirectional. <laughs> we had the word reflect. What's, what would be the more appropriate form of the word reflect in this case? The reflectance. Bidirectional reflectance <laughs> blank function. Density. Almost. Density is kind of a good, a good concept there. Distribution. The bidirectional reflectance distribution function. All right. In other words, if light is coming in <coughs> from one direction, we want to find out all the different ways it's going to travel after that. So that's the distribution. So what percentage just goes along the reflectance uh, vector? What percentage would be transmitted? What uh, <coughs> what uh, what percentage is reflected back in the same direction? Right. So distribution. What what is the distribution there? Okay. The bidirectional reflectance distribution function. Okay, <coughs> so let's take a look at this. The bidirectional reflectance distribution function, BRDF. All right. So here's the frame of reference. We uh, we have the point X right here in the middle that we're interested in. This is where the reflectance is happening, and we have the direction going towards the light, and we have the directance going towards the viewer. All right. <coughs> so we use omega i for in and omega O for out. So which way is it coming in? Which way is it going out? And then we talked about the normal and the normal is basically perpendicular to the surface that you're taking a look at. It's the direction that X faces, okay? <coughs> and then we have this round area, this circle here, we can measure the angle uh, <coughs> on the plane that is the incoming direction and the outgoing direction and we would call if we had some fixed point over here, we would say uh, phi i represents what direction is the light coming in. Um, and then we have a, sev a separate measurement for saying which direction does the output go. Okay. So <coughs> here's the, uh, the larger problem. This is the other one you have to memorize, the rendering equation. The rendering equation. There's six parts to the rendering equation. The first part is the, the answer. We're asking the question, how much light leaves x <laughs> leaves the point X going towards direction omega O. All right, so for uh, our typical rendering, we're talking local illumination. Uh, omega O is just the viewer uh, direction. <coughs> so that's the answer to the question. How much light, what is the total amount of light leaving a point X towards omega O? So how much light is are we gonna actually see? Then the second part is now that that the answer to that includes any light that's emitted from the surface from the point X. So if it's a light source, this number would be positive. If it was just a, you know, like the table or something, there's no, <coughs> it has no intrinsic light to itself. So it would be zero, okay? So this is a positive function and it could be phosphorescence or some other effect we're trying to achieve. If you've ever seen the glowing effect, if you're playing a first person shooter, like you have like surfaces that look like they're glowing, that's because they're simulating the LE, the emitted uh, light from that surface. And so you basically just don't apply any kind of, uh, <coughs> um, there's, no, there's no like uh, shortening or anything like that that goes along with it. <coughs> okay, so uh, then we have the integral, this the third part. And this integral basically represents the hemisphere around the point X. And essentially we're, we're saying, let's treat every direction as a potential source of light, all right? So we'll take a look at every direction coming in and make see if it's a point of light. <coughs> there are some mathematical tools we can use if we just wanna isolate that to one direction only. But if you're gonna solve the, the whole equation, you need to consider all of the incoming reflection. So when you do global illumination, you're basically answering that question how much light <laughs> is reflected from the table? Well, you have to add up how much light was reflected from the wall and from the ceiling and from how much actually came from the light. So every direction. Then we actually have the BRDF, which is F sub R. <laughs> Think of this as like, it's the reflectance function. So F is our function, R means reflectance. How much light gets reflected if it's coming in from omega I and going towards omega O. So obviously, um, if you have a diffuse uh, reflection, then basically any incoming light will bounce off evenly in every direction. That's the Lambertian 
uh, style. And if you were talking about um, something as shiny, then you would expect to see that the outgoing direction, <laughs> the closer it gets to the actual reflectance vector for, for that um, incoming light, then the stronger it'll be. Okay, so that's just like how a mirror works. You only get, you only see yourself at the complementary angle around, around the normal. You don't see yourself anywhere else, okay? Um, <clears throat> then we have L sub I, which is the incoming light coming from a direction omega I towards our point X, okay? That's where we say we're treating every direction as a potential source of light. All right, and then we have the, um, the positive dot product. And so we use these angle brackets to, to say anything that's greater than zero. <coughs> so we, do, we don't want negative dot products here. We want positive dot products because you're not supposed to reflect negative light. So what we say is, okay, that the maximum amount of, the maximum amount of uh, reflected light is dependent on the incoming light direction and the normal, all right? So you can't just, uh, uh, that's generally the, that's Lambert's emission law. <coughs> So the intensity is proportional to the cosine of the angle of light and the surface normal. <clears throat> now you also have something true that the amount of light that you can actually uh, see from the viewer's perspective is also proportional to the dot product between the viewer angle and the normal as well. So there's actually two uh, elements that <laughs> come into play, but the one that gets talked about most often is the incoming light direction. And that's part of the rendering equation. Okay, then, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we mentioned that was the positive cosine and it's equivalent to the, ma to the maximum of omega i dot omega g and zero. So obviously if it's any negative value, it'll, it'll just get clamped up to zero. And <laughs> that means that this value is always between zero and one. So uh, not only do we have, so this is basically how you can describe just about any kind of rendering equation. Uh, there's another one called the scattering equation, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. Um, we're going to focus on this one, the rendering equation. But <clears throat> um, we were we were talking about what kinds of reflection models are there, and so the easiest one to implement is the Lambertian one, where it's a constant. So we say that rho is the light absorption of the material. For instance, this blue chair absorbs every color except for blue; it just reflects blue. All right, uh, and every other color gets absorbed in it somehow. <clears throat> And then we divide that by pi, and that has to do with the fact that we're taking the area <coughs> of the hemisphere, okay? So um, <coughs> if, uh, if you were to take the area of a sphere, right? So we'll just take a look for that. <coughs> area of a sphere. I wanna say it's two pi r or four pi r. <laughs> four pi r squared, okay? So it's gonna be two pi if the radius is one, right? And uh, actually if the radius is like one half, so you have like a perfectly, you know, a diameter of one, but well, it doesn't matter, it's four pi. If the radius is one, then the total surface area of, of a hemisphere is two pi. And there is, a, there is a trick to doing the integral, if you were to take the integral of uh, two pi um, <coughs> over, the, over the, uh, the hemisphere, then you actually have to divide out pi in order to make sure that you get a integral of one. In other words, you don't, if you wanna conserve energy, you have to divide by pi. Okay, so you have to divide by the surface area. Um, <coughs> so, if there's only one light from one direction and no absorption, in other words, it's just white, right? It reflects every frequency of light the same, then our BRDF is going to be one over pi times omega i dot omega g, all right? So that's just a very simple, that's, that's where we get what we call n dot l lighting because n is the normal, l is the light direction. And so most of the time, the easiest way to do lighting is just n dot l. Now, if there's a different amount of absorption from the material, then we can get color, which we'll call C underscore D. So it's like a, a vector with of color. <coughs> so for example, if it was white, then we would say red, green, blue is one, and blue is zero, zero, one. So this would, if you wanted to make a blue chair, then this is how you would make a blue chair, 
Okay, pretty easy. It's just simple multiplication. All right, <clears throat> so, uh, so looking at that very simple BRDF, we have to keep in mind that there's some rules that they have to obey. So the first one is that they have to conserve energy. What this means is that you cannot reflect more light than is reflected back, okay? So you can't, you know, if the intensity of light coming into a surface X is, is one, you can't reflect two. That's just not how it works. Uh, secondly, uh, BRDS have to have the same reflection both ways, all right? And um, <coughs> this is particularly true uh, uh, if you think about two cases, let, let's just think of the case that the surface is nothing but a bunch of uh, specular facets. In other words, they're basically little tiny mirror surfaces. Well, if it's going to be a mirror surface, then it, it's clear that because it reflects on the normal, that if you swap directions, it will have no effect. Uh, likewise, <coughs> um, if you were to calculate the BRDF for a a, a plain diffuse surface where we say light reflects evenly in every direction, then there is no change. It's a constant value either way that you get out. And so that is going to be the same as uh, you can swap the angles all day long. It doesn't have any effect. And lastly, rule number three is that BRDFs have to be positive. In other words, uh, you can't have, you know, some areas where it's negative. Okay. <laughs> it basically all has to uh, reflect some uh, it either reflects nothing or it reflects everything. Uh, and most of the time there is some absorption to the material. So uh, it's very rare for anything to perfectly reflect any, any amount of light. So sometimes uh, we might say cap it at like 96%. Otherwise the model starts to l fall apart because then you basically get <coughs> light just reflecting around the room endlessly. You know, there's no attenuation. So you want attenuation. Uh, attenuation happens naturally. Okay, <clears throat> so let's take a look at this uh, more specifically. Um, they have to conserve energy. So if you were to take the integral around the hemisphere, then the uh, amount you get should be less than or equal to one. So a lot of times what you'll do is you'll take a BRDF that you have an idea how it's supposed to work. And it'll you'll sometimes you get a, a value greater than one. And what you'll do is take that value then and scale the, the whole integral down. So you'll say, you know, so if you get pi times F sub R, then you'll divide by pi in the BRDF. That way you make sure that it's normalized. In other words, when you do the integral, when you divide by pi, <coughs> it'll take care of that, okay? Uh, and then you can swap the angles both ways and you can also make sure it's positive everywhere. Okay, so uh, we mentioned last time that we would also pick some uh, letter names. So we would have N is the surface normal, V is the outgoing direction, L is incoming. H is the half angle vector, so you just add W, uh, omega I and omega O and normalize it. And uh, R represents the reflection vector where you just take, <coughs> uh, and there's a nuance to this one too. Uh, when we're gonna talk about Fong shading here. Okay, but R is basically you take any, uh, you wanna find out uh, a vector that's reflected, then you take <laughs> omega uh, i, or it could be anything. Um, depends if you're trying to calculate the direction the light should reflect to in the ideal case, or <laughs> the position you're trying to look up if you're uh, calculating an environment map. Okay, <coughs> and you may have heard of n dot l, which is the same thing as omega i dot omega g. Okay, and then we, we talked about how we basically throw away the integral because we're not simulating global illumination right now. We're just doing local illumination. All right, <coughs> so let's um, prepare for shading, okay? We're gonna prepare to shade. And at last time we were trying to make sure that we had all our angles correct. If you, if you don't take the time to make sure your angles are correct going in, then that error is just gonna propagate itself down when you're actually trying to calculate a BRDF, which are more complicated than, than these uh, vectors tend to be. So <coughs> um, I personally like to compute everything in world space uh, rather than screen space. And, um, and because of that, that means you need, to, you, need to be, you need to pay particular attention when you're going online and looking at tutorials for how do I do Blin Fong or how do I do uh, or an air or whatever the case is, because if you're not using the right coordinate system, that can throw you off because sometimes you can make some assumptions about the coordinate system that will help you calculate your BRDF. <coughs> and you have to keep in mind that most people talking about a BRDF 
are not interested in is this is this bona fide like correct they want to know will this let me ship my game with better graphics than my competitor and they will we talked about jim blinn's the ancient art of cheating right uh so you have to be careful when you go out because not ever you know this stuff to be honest with you it takes years to understand you have to like read the papers and read the papers and, and implement it and implement it until you finally like oh i was missing that or uh, or to get an intuition about how to make something go faster <coughs> uh, or more understandable okay and we're going to take a look at that today when we look at or nayer okay so we have these um <coughs> We have our uh, V position, view direction, the normal, and the texture coordinate. So the ones in particular we'll pay attention to today are position, view direction, and normal. <coughs> and uh, the idea uh, here is that we can, um, you know, when we're in our vertex shader, we want to get these uh, correct, done correctly. And then in our fragment shader, we want we can break down the the act of shading into a few different steps. So the first part is we can prepare our vectors. So this is the the bare bare basic, like what can we determine just based off of the uh, world space coordinates we have. Then the second part is to prepare the material. These are constants that we have that tell us about <coughs> surface roughness or surface color, okay? And then uh, we'll have information about the light sources themselves. So we're gonna be simple and, and in this class we'll, we're going to, our objective is can we simulate the location of the sun can we simulate the location of the moon? And can we simulate what the sky uh, ought to look like? All right, that's some of our, our personal goals. So we have at least three areas of light that we would like to take a look at. <coughs> and potentially even uh, what is the surrounding area? What does the surrounding area look like? Okay, so <coughs> after we do that, uh, then we can actually calculate the lighting. And when we're, when we're done with that, uh, as, as uh, you may remember, um, I don't know if we'll get to tone mapping today, but I'll just quickly mention what it is. <coughs> this is the act of gamma correction. Gamma, does anybody know what gamma correction is? What would you use gamma correction for? And, and it's totally okay if you have an explanation of, I use it in this game to do X, Y, Z. What is gamma correction used for? It's, it's more of a brightness shift, more of a brightness shift. Um, <clears throat> for example, um, you could be playing Minecraft and it's just too dark. So you go into the, the settings and there's the gamma correction and you're like, let's bump that up a little bit so I can see. And it's the act of, of um, compensating for the fact that when your display shows the values of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, up to 255, it's not a linear you don't perceive that as linear, okay? <clears throat> and so you need to gamma correct so that you, you move the values so that it looks linear, so that if you were to go from zero to 255, it looks like a smooth gradient. And so, uh, because when we're doing our lighting calculations, we want to do that in linear space. In other words, if, if we say the light is 600 lumens, then we know that if we were to bump that down to 300 lumens, we would get half the brightness. But if you don't, if you're using a, uh, a color space like Adobe RGB or sRGB, then you're not working in linear space. It's already been compressed down to log space. And so you can't just do, you know, half of log space is not the same as half of linear space. So you'll get your calculations all messed up if you're not using linear space. <coughs> so that's something that you have to keep in mind. So tone mapping is the way for us to figure out our linear, convert linear coordinates back into um, uh, sRGB or so we normally use a gamma of 2.2. All right. So <clears throat> those are, those are the, the minimum number of steps that we need just to get properly shaded image out in, images out. So, <clears throat> uh, one way I like to do it, um, you know, I, I like to use structures inside my GLSL shader so I can, uh, you know, use the, use the elements that I know are common to my fragment shader and versus what's a material property and versus what a light property is. Um, and it's basically a way of not doing premature optimization. You basically just like, okay, what do I know at this point? Because if I wanted to go 
and do G-buffering and, and deferred shader, then I would know what I need to keep separate, okay? So I could take this, if I wanted to optimize it later, then I could take this and I, and I know what I can calculate at each step. <clears throat> okay, so uh, some of these, like I said, are, you know, N, our view direction, the reflection direction of, of V around N, um, <laughs> N.V and N.R. Okay, those are some things that we can do. And then uh, inside the vertex shader, the way that I would calculate this is I would take my world matrix and I would grab the top three by three and I would just multiply it by my incoming normal, okay? And so when I do that, <coughs> uh, this is assuming that my world matrix kind of follows some general rules. And what would those general rules be? It, it needs to be a linear transformation. Okay, so if I just do uniform scaling and uh, rotation and that's it, then I know that when I take the inverse matrix that it's basically the same thing as doing the transpose. So the proper way to do it is to take the inverse transpose of your world matrix, but if, if as you recall, like a regular rotation matrix, the inverse is the transpose. So there's no reason for me to take the inverse when I can just take the transpose since the inverse transpose is the same matrix I'm getting out. So as long as you don't break rules here and, and, and you're sticking to just regular transformations, <coughs> then you can just grab this as a, the top three by three. Okay, then I just copy the color over if I'm using it. The texture coordinates, I'm swapping the Y coordinates so that my textures are going the right direction. <coughs> and then uh, I, I take, I get my world space coordinate by multiplying my world matrix by my position. And then I do the view direction. <coughs> this was uh, actually one of the, um, I mentioned that the camera matrix is not a normal matrix. The camera matrix is an inverse matrix. So <coughs> as, as you recall on Monday, we were trying to figure out why we weren't getting some of the reflection uh, done quite right or, or the camera. So I had to take the inverse of the camera matrix. And I'll basically get the camera world matrix and then I can grab the third column, or I mean the uh, fourth column, and that's and subtract my position from it. Okay, so this gives me a vector from my point X on my on my uh, model towards the view direction. So that is exactly what I want. <coughs> okay, and then I can calculate my actual position that I'm going to draw on the screen by calculating projection matrix times the camera matrix. And if you want to, you can make this very efficient by calculating all these matrices and pass them in as uniforms rather than calculate them in your vertex shader. Um, <coughs> but I haven't noticed any significant speed, uh, speed losses just from just doing everything in the vertex shader. So why not? We'll just, uh, uh, power is pretty cheap. We'll just waste the power. Okay, so then in our fragment shader, uh, you know, we, we're gonna output to our fragment color and basically when we're done with these steps, we'll have a tone map color that we can draw straight to the screen. <laughs> this last one, 1.0, is alpha, so if we're trying to do alpha blending of some sort, then we would put an alpha color, in, uh, or an alpha. Alpha is linear, always linear, uh, whereas your color is going to be log space, so there's a difference there. Okay, <clears throat> so here's the structure I was telling you about. Uh, so I have a face normal. This is the one where we use the standard derivatives extension to actually calculate the normal based on the pixel. And then N would represent, uh, we're gonna calculate bump mapping normals off that at a future point. And then we have our view, our R, N dot V, N dot R. So all those things I was telling you about. Um, <coughs> uh, so when we wanna prepare for shading, then we can go ahead and normalize the normal coming in from the vertex shader. We can calculate the face normal by using the, the standard derivatives. Uh, this is just a little trick here that if the, if I didn't assign normals coming in and they're all zeros, then the length of that normal would be zero. So I could just say, if I don't have a normal coming in, then let's just replace it with one that I know I have. So at the very least you get flat shading if you forgot to provide normals uh, to your um, shader. <coughs> okay, and then we can calculate uh, V by normalizing the view direction. We can calculate the reflection. There's, there's an actual function called reflect. So if you don't wanna remember the you know, the, which I did find the graphic, by the way, that is, um, <clears throat> I 
This is this one over here. So <laughs> if you're going to reflect V around N, then N dot V will basically tell you it's the cosine, right? Because we're interested in the cosine. So then if we take the cosine and we multiply it by two, right? Now we have a, and we multiply it by N, technically N is now a vector. This two N dot V N basically is a vector going from X all the way up to N. And then we subtract R, uh, or actually we subtract V from this. So V minus this one is going to give us a vector pointing from uh, this point here to this point here, which because vectors don't have an origin, that is the exact same vector as this point go, going to R, okay? So this was basically a graphical way of describing what's happening. This, this cosine, we're scaling the normal by two times the cosine. <coughs> and when you subtract two vectors, you basically get a vector pointing from one point to the other. <coughs> All right, let me get some. Cool. <coughs> Um, here, all right, so uh, that's what we're doing here. There's a reflection, there's a reflect function, and uh, then we can calculate n dot v and n dot r and save those for later. <coughs> so now we're into the next step. So we prepared the, all of our normals and view vectors and all that. Now we can go to the next step is, okay, let's find out, what information do we have that we can use to shade the, our, our object, okay? So <coughs> uh, one of the easiest ones to do is the diffuse color. So what color, is it a blue chair, is it a yellow chair? Um, specular color, this is the color that gets reflected when you shine, when you shine a light on it. So uh, if you want to reflect the color of gold, for instance, basically you could just approximate uh, reflecting a metal color by just saying, okay, well, it reflects gold. So if I shine white light on this surface, then it, it will reflect gold light, basically. Um, <clears throat> so that is a, that is how you approximate metallic surfaces. Uh, otherwise, you just set the specular color to the color of the light, right? So if you're shining a red light, then you could just say, I would only expect red to be reflected back. Now, if you're shining white light, then of course you could just set it too white. <clears throat> okay, then we have the uh, specular roughness, uh, which we would call M. You'll see M in the literature. And we can compute the exponent. <clears throat> so we're going to take a look at how uh, we can use the exponent to basically measure how, some, how shiny something is. Uh, but the idea here is that you could take M and uh, apply this equation 2 over M squared minus 2. <clears throat> and let's just think about what that does. So if M is 0, um, we, we can tell we have a problem because two over zero is going to be infinity, right? So that means like infinite shininess. So in other words, it's not rough at all. It's perfectly shiny. Okay. <clears throat> For that reason, we normally make sure that this is some minimum number, like, uh, cause you're, you're basically dividing two over whatever that small number is. So if you want to, a, a good range is to shoot for a number that's anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 as your maximum exponent, because uh, <coughs> we're gonna apply this to the cosine. And when you, um, when you apply this to the cosine, you're basically gonna take the cosine wave and like, skin, it's gonna get skinny like a Gaussian wave, like a Gaussian um, uh, reflection, right? Until eventually you get to a, a singularity where you only reflect at the, at the precise vector that the, pri the precise direction that it would reflect um, if it was a mirror, okay? And, <coughs> Then if roughness is one, then we have two divided by one minus two. So two minus two is zero. And so if you were to raise anything to the power of zero, you get one. So in other words, you just reflect evenly. It, it, it acts like a diffuse surface basically. <coughs> so, and then uh, anything in between, like if you had a, a let's say you passed in 0 0.5, 0 0.5 squared is what 0.25? Um, and then two over 0.25 is uh, eight. Eight minus two is six. So then you get any number basically between zero and say 10,000 or 20,000. Okay. <clears throat> then we also need to know the uh, index of refraction. So if it was like a glass, uh, it might be 1.5. If it was water, it would be 1.333. Um, <clears throat> if you're talking about a diamond, it would be 
or 2.5 at the max, all right? So uh, you can basically simulate, you know, what should the amount of reflected light be using the Fresnel. <coughs> and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to explore that today. I don't know yet. And then we have our base Fresnel, which we would call F0. And this is what is the maximum amount of light that can be reflected at that angle, okay? So for now, it could be calculated as uh, one minus um, N <coughs> over one plus N, and you square that. So if it was uh, 1.5, then one minus 1.5 is 0.5 over one plus 1.5, which is 2.5. And so <coughs> uh, 0.5 over uh, 2.5 is one over five. So then you're talking one over five squared is one over 25, and that's basically 0 0.04. So uh, if you're talking about regular, what we call dielectric materials like plastic or anything else like that, you at your, at your base reflectance, <coughs> in other words, when you're shining a light straight on top of a surface, you would expect uh, that only 0.04% of light would be reflected back towards the light source. That's what Fresnel is telling you. And so if you're, if then you're at any other angle, then um, you can, you can figure out how much light should be reflected. But at the very, at the very worst, right, only 0.04 would be reflected back. And so uh, water would be a little bit less than that. It's typical to get values of uh, 0.02 to 0.05 for most dielectrics. And then it's completely different for metals, <coughs> but we might have to talk about metals a different day. And then we have this um, GGX gamma. GGX is all the rave right now. <clears throat> and um, uh, we're gonna start talking about, uh, it's basically the, the latest and greatest in reflectance in terms of um, what you can do with it. <coughs> okay, so uh, preparing the light. So we've got the material prepared. So this is basically everything that's going to affect how our material will affect the, the reflection of light. And then the lights are going to, we're gonna say, let's, let's just allow for a certain minimum number of lights. Uh, so <clears throat> we'll call light zero is the sun. Uh, that's one of the easiest ones to kind of calculate, you know, what is like the main directional light coming in. Uh, we wanna also do light one as the moon. Um, did, did we watch uh, the one classic video with the sun and the moon? Do you guys remember? Carla's, uh, was it Carla's dream or something like that? We may have to watch it again. <clears throat> I just can't remember. I've shown it a couple times and uh, it was like an old video from the 80s. It had the, the cool guitar music and okay, we'll have to, we'll have to have a special, uh, special time to watch that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so we're going to call light one as the sun. <clears throat> I mean, light one is the moon because it'd be nice to have two interacting lights. And then we'll have light. Uh, the, the next light after that is irradiance. Uh, what do you think irradiance is? Irradiance is the light that's coming onto the surface from far away. So if you're, in other words, if you walk into a room and, the, and, and you're standing next to a red wall, then the irradiance on you, it's gonna look, if I were to take your picture and you're wearing a white shirt, I would expect to see your shirt to look a little red from the reflection of the wall. Irradiance is basically low frequency light of the surrounding environment. And when you don't have irradiance, then objects don't look, you're either in a perfectly, like a perfect environment <coughs> where, uh, you don't, you, you can't tell that you're like inside of a cathedral or inside of a museum or inside of a classroom, okay? If I was to, if I was to Photoshop, has anybody ever tried to Photoshop one object from one photo and try to stick it in another? It, it oftentimes you're like, it, how come it looks in place in one photo, but it doesn't look in place in the other photo? It, the colors are off, it, there's a shift there, and that's why. <laughs> and then we'll call light number two or three reflection. So this is the light say coming from the sky. You know, this is, this is the amount of light that I see like on my computer here, I can see my screen shining at me, but I can also see the reflection off of the surface. And so reflection is another source of light. Okay. 
<coughs> so we're gonna we're gonna try to like build up right a, a whole set of light that we can uh, uh, you know make something that looks pretty good. <coughs> okay. Now we start calculating all sorts of different kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> for example, we can get the light direction. We have the actual energy of the light. So is this like a 2000 lumen light bulb or is this like a 600 lumen light bulb? There's the actual energy of the light. So I'd expect the sun to be a really high value, but a lamp inside of a building to be um, much lower. And these are useful because then if you actually plug in real life values, it helps you test whether your algorithm is working or not. It's too easy to just say, um, yeah, white light is one, but does that really mean anything in the real world? So how do you know that you're getting physically based light if you're not even using physical, actual physical values, okay? <clears throat> so then we have a, a, you know, what special information does the dot product give us again? The cosine, the angle. The cosine. yeah. So we, if we want the angle between two vectors, we calculate the dot product. And most of the time we're not actually interested in the angle, we're interested in the cosine anyway. So it's like a double win there, okay? But we would say that the dot product is, represents the angle between two vectors. So we're, we want the angle between the normal and the view, <coughs> normal and the reflection, normal and the light, normal and the half angle, uh, <coughs> angle between the light and the Fresnel direction, uh, angle between the light and the half angle, and angle between the view and the half angle. <coughs> There's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, the one angle we have not really talked about is this one over here we call L dot D. And uh, what this represents is what is the, <coughs> what is the angle between the half angle and the light? So we know that it's, it's roughly half between of, the, of what the <coughs> uh, L plus V is, right? But if we want to find out what the angle between the half angle and the light is, then <clears throat> uh, we need to calculate another dot product. And so technically we're, we're calculating L dot H, but we're only using this calculation when we're talking about the Fresnel, okay? Um, <clears throat> and that's because the half angle represents the, the in-between point of where the reflection is occurring. And so if we want to measure the angle for the Fresnel, we need to measure it between H and, and L. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about diffuse BRDFs again. So I'm just curious, just curious, how many people are going through information overload right now? <laughs> okay. Uh, how many people didn't realize there was this much involved in making light look as good as we can in an image? <laughs> okay, there was probably some guess that there's probably a lot of effort that goes into making it, okay? <clears throat> um, this, is, this is personally from like years of experience myself trying to understand how all these equations work and even when I go back and look at things I wrote like my master's thesis, I can actually like go back and be like, Oh yeah, I was totally wrong on that. Like I had the wrong idea in my brain that I eventually fixed later, but I can see the, the cycle uh, occurring, all right? So don't be uh, scared if, you, if this doesn't soak in in like the, the, you know, the 30 minutes I've been talking to you. But uh, through practice, it, that's how you get to learn how this stuff works, okay? But <clears throat> I'm basically trying to give you the, you know, the, the short, short version, if you will. Sure, the search terms necessary to learn. Yes. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Make sure that this is silent. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, we were uh, we were thinking about diffuse reflection as the scattering of light in all in all directions. All right, in all directions. Um, <laughs> in other words, <clears throat> when you reflect light, when you have one direction coming in, it's just going to be evenly distributed at every angle, which is not really true. But that's, that's the easiest, that's Lambert's emission law, all right? And generally speaking, that's how it works, okay? <clears throat> However, then, you know, once we've decided that it doesn't work, we're going to find out 
we need to find out why doesn't it work, okay? And so the question here is, um, do all materials reflect light isotropically? In other words, do they all reflect light evenly in every direction? And the answer is no, they do not, okay? Um, and and here's, here's the one, uh, the moon was, is a classic case of why doesn't the moon <clears throat> have the, the fall off that you see with the diffuse reflection. Okay, so when we look at the moon, it doesn't look, it doesn't behave like a diffuse surface and that's because there's dust on the moon. And so because of the dust on the moon, when light from the sun is reflecting off of it, we don't see that fall off as if it was actually scattering light evenly in all directions. Uh, another, another case is a pot. If you were to take a look at a clay a clay pot that has not been glazed yet. Um, <clears throat> that is a very rough surface and you would expect it to have diffuse reflection, but it doesn't reflect the normal way. All right, so let me show you an example. Uh, Cause we're gonna talk about Oranea here, <clears throat> but here's a, a classic image from their, uh, there's a, there, here's a classic image from their paper. And Here's, here's what you would actually see in real life, and then here's what a Lambertian model looks like. And so clearly, uh, a lot of surfaces do not act with, a, with a, like the Lambertian model, okay? And so this is, if you only do N dot L lighting, this is what it looks like. And this is why when you look at older computer graphics that only use N dot L, that's what it looks like. And you see these dark edges that are not natural, okay? Most, most objects don't have a dark fall off on the end. <laughs> okay, so we have, uh, we're going to talk about Oranea here. Okay, <clears throat> but when we take a look at the Lambertian reflection, it is an isotropic model. In other words, it assumes that when light from any direction comes in and hits it, it's going to reflect evenly in every other direction, which is not true for most kinds of surfaces. Some surfaces, yes, but not really. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, we, we would say that when we're reflecting, it's N dot L. Okay, so N dot L is the simplest one you could do that represents um, uh, that kind of reflection. So <clears throat> we have the Oranea model, okay? And this one models rough diffuse microfacets, okay? So let's, let's think about what microfacets are for just a second. I have a graphic here that kind of shows um, Well, diffuse, um, diffuse services, uh, I have a, let me see. I think there's a way <coughs> of uh, annotation. Let's, let's try that out. So <coughs> here's, here's what we're basically talking about. Um, we, we might say that a surface has micro facets. In other words, that, that instead of being perfectly flat, we have these uh, random, you know, surfaces that are, uh, that are pointing. That's not maybe the right, let's, let's go with, these are the micro facets, okay? So we can approximate the surface as a, as a bunch of uh, basically grooves and, and each one of these is reflecting. So we would say, that it's a specular microfacet model if the light going in reflects on the normal, okay? So what we're saying is this is what the model looks like. We have, we have um, microfacets and they're just reflecting light, okay? <coughs> so that's, that's a specular microfacet model. In other words, we, do we just treat the surface as a bunch of normally Gaussian, we use a Gaussian distribution to say what direction they're oriented, but more or less when they reflect light, they reflect light in one direction, okay? But a, a, a diffuse uh, micro facet model doesn't, reflect, doesn't ref, reflect like that. So if you have an incoming direction of light, then it actually has uh, all that light gets reflected evenly in every direction. So that's diffuse where it basically, one direction of light comes in and then it reflects light in every direction. So if you, what Orin Nair did was treat <coughs> the, the surface behavior as if they were diffuse microfacets. In other words, when they reflect light, they reflect the light everywhere, 
and versus the specular model where it reflects light only as mirror directions at the, at the small scale, okay? So there's a, there's a nuance here. <coughs> okay, so I'll close that. <coughs> and so uh, what they, what they, they use these rough diffuse micro facets and they basically did a numerical model. They did some curve fitting. And I like to say that the Oranayer gives objects a dusty appearance, all right? A dusty appearance. And so uh, in this graphic, you can see the, the roughness uh, kind of go from a zero all the way up to one. And, and it might be a little hard to tell in this particular uh, <coughs> set of graphics here, but what, what ends up happening is that when you rotate the model, it just, it doesn't have that shininess associated if you were to treat it as if it was a perfect diffuse reflector, okay? Now, <clears throat> the problem is, is that when you first look at the Oranair BRDF, um, this is the, the formula that it's defined by. So you have one minus one half, uh, normally it's sigma squared. So I'll put M squared over M squared plus 0.57 because this was a fitted model. Uh, and then B equals this, <coughs> C equals sine alpha times tangent beta. And then your actual result is going to be rho over pi times uh, a plus gamma times b times c. And then in order to calculate alpha, then it's the maximum of the angle theta uh, between the normal and the vector and the normal and the light. And beta is the minimum angle uh, either from the normal to the view or the normal to the light. And then gamma is the maximum of zero <laughs> and the cosine of theta i minus theta uh, uh, phi o, so phi i minus phi o, which if I were to tell you right now, okay, go do or an air, you, you guys would probably be like, <clears throat> I'm quitting, <laughs> right? Because <clears throat> we have not prepared you mathematically to deal with this. So <clears throat> there, are, there are tricks though uh, to go ahead and, and take these. And this is where understanding how these models work, you, you get a, a sense for how you actually do this. Uh, so, <clears throat> so what I did is, I said that gamma is not hard, but it's tricky to think about. Okay, so if we go back to our, um, our BRDF model, and so <clears throat> here's one where, you know, you have your incoming direction of light, you have your outgoing direction of light, those parallelograms represent more or less the amount of the quantity of light that can be reflected. And you have this, um, you, you have these angles, say phi i, so this is the, the direction going towards the incoming angle of light. And you have phi o, which, you know, technically, if a light shining right here, it's clear that I can walk around it, right? And so my direction it, that is associated with, with what I'm looking at uh, can, can vary. <coughs> And so that's, that is what is happening here. Uh, so in order to uh, do this, we basically can treat phi i as the angle between L and V. Now, here's how I do it. This is, this is how I was sitting down and I was thinking about how do you actually go about figuring out what this is? Well, for one, I decided, well, let's look up the trig uh, identities for you know, cosine of, of alpha minus beta, right? And so when you get that, uh, you get, you, you expand this uh, identity and you get cosine phi i times cosine phi o plus sine phi i times sine phi o. <coughs> so what I did here is I was thinking about it and I was like, what if, what if you, you fixed one of the uh, uh, phi o so that it, um, it doesn't change. It doesn't change. In other words, we'll just assume that, you know, because the, the formula uh, is not dependent on knowing exactly which directions Al and Veer are uh, pointing. It's, it's about knowing how they're positioned in relationship to each other. So I said, <coughs> let's, let's go ahead um, and, and treat phi uh, O so that it's pointing uh, at, at angle zero. Let's just assume that it's pointing at angle zero because uh, we don't know what phi i and phi o are. We have to determine those. So if you do that, then the cosine of zero is one and the sine of zero is zero. So then I can just get rid of the term on the right 
and I'm left with phi, which all it is is the angle between the light and <coughs> the viewer on the plane, okay? <coughs> so, uh, so we're basically left with, you know, okay, well, what is the, the angle between L and V, all right? And um, I guess technically you, you, would, uh, uh, you would only take a look at this, this has to be done in relationship to the, to the plane. But so some people have um, solved gamma basically as, so you, you can use the normal. So V minus N dot, the dot product of VN and times L minus N times the uh, um, <coughs> uh, LN. All right, so this is another way to get gamma. All right, so there's, there's some ways to just rewrite it in terms of uh, vectors that we do know, <coughs> all right? So, but this is how I do it. I, I use L dot V. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> the next part is how do we evaluate sine alpha and tangent beta? So, this one is written tricky, right? Because we have that one is the minimum of these two angles and the other one is the, is the maximum of the two angles. So, with that one, you just have to think about if I had a function that took the minimum of a and b and a function that took the max of a and b, well, it's just the same as saying f of a times f of b. So the min max is just a, it's neither here nor there. <coughs> so, and then the other thing is that if we don't, if we only have the sine, then we can, we can figure out the sine by calculating the cosine. And we can get cosines all day long by doing dot products. So here's what we do. We have sine alpha times tangent beta. And we say, that we can say tangent beta is the same thing as sine over cosine, right? That's just tangent. So now we have sine alpha times sine beta, and this is where we use that first rule. That's just, it, it doesn't really matter. We can just take the square root of one minus cosine squared theta. And so this is where we have uh, n dot L. Well, then we could just, uh, <laughs> we could just figure out, well, which one of these is, ma is bigger and just pick that one. So we can calculate, since we're already calculating that dot product anyway, just the, the bottom is going to be whatever the larger one is, okay? <laughs> and this is basically a way of choosing the angle that, that maximizes, um, you know, because we're dividing here. We, we want to pick the angle that causes the, the, the most, uh, so when you divide by a small number, you tend to make the, the, the final number bigger. So we're trying to find the, the shortest uh, or, or the one that causes, the, what's the most reflection? So do you reflect more light along uh, L or do you reflect more light along V? Okay, so that's the trick going on there. So then when we do this calculation again, <coughs> then we can basically rewrite the Oranair as this expression right here, which is written in terms that we can actually calculate, okay? <laughs> now, one of the, the cool parts about this is that if you were to set your roughness to zero, then it's clear that one minus one half times zero is just one, and B is just is going to be zero because 0 0.45 times zero is just zero. So what ends up happening is that our uh, F, our BRDF then is just pi over rho times zero plus zero. So it it generalizes all the way back to the, uh, the regular Lambertian BRDF. So if roughness is zero, we just stick with uh, uh, the, the regular N dot L type lighting. And as we increase the roughness, then we get more and more of the Oranair effect. Okay. <coughs> so uh, maybe we should take a quick break and just see this in action. All right. So uh, that is what I'm going to do. Um, so that should be running. So I'll pull up my GLSL over here. <clears throat> Take a look at the G buffer. Um, actually, I'm going to use this one down here. <coughs> All right. If I didn't break it, oh, I did break it. Well, We'll go back to this one and fix it, but. Okay, so over here. Um, so now I, 
we should just fix this one. <coughs> this won't be hard to do. Okay, um, line 194. Wrong. Okay, line 194. And line 197. Okay, great. Um, the reason I did this is because I added a zoom feature. So I can I can zoom in, right? And we can take a look at a, a closer, closer look at our objects. <laughs> and so there are face normals and there are, we don't, we haven't calculated bump mapping yet, but this is basically our smooth normals coming in. And then um, this is our texture coordinates, okay? So if we were applying a texture mapping, this represents the uh, S and T coordinates, all right? Uh, then we also have our vertex color, which they're all white. <coughs> uh, our view direction. So if I, I guess I should zoom out for this one, but this is our view direction should change, right? Because we're rotating around this in world space. So this wasn't changing as much last time. So I got that fixed. This was because I wasn't taking the inverse uh, camera matrix. All right. So I got that fixed. And then we have our reflection direction. Uh, this this has to do with um, <coughs> the the angle that gets reflected. So this this is changing for us. So if we we're going to reflect the sky or something, we would expect this to change based on our view. All right. So since our view direction is fixed, this is also fixed. Uh, then we have our half angle direction. So this represents the uh, v plus l. All right. So this also changes in respect to our view. <laughs> There's only one singularity there, and that it occurs at one one like location there. All right, so there's our half direction. Uh, there's n dot l. So if you're just to take straight, you know, diffuse reflection, more or less, this is what it would look like. So this is why classic computer graphics looks this way. All right, and so if I were to like swing the sun around, you know, this is why we get that certain look to it. And in fact, you can see over here. <coughs> right here that this is matching this, uh, this concept here. We get that darkening on the edges, okay? So then we have n dot v. So n dot v is going to, um, <coughs> we're, we're basically gonna, this is gonna be useful for calculating some lighting calculations. Uh, it looks like it's, it has some effect to that when we actually look at it. Then we have uh, n, uh, v dot h. <coughs> Okay, this is actually a, technically, I guess, the same calculation as L dot H as well, um, which we'll be using for a different kind of diffuse model. And then we have our depth. So I can actually change that. So, you know, this is what our depth map lo would look like. It just stores um, how far objects are from each other. So this is what your Z buffer looks like, by the way. Uh, your Z buffer looks, you know, so brighter values represent we're closer to the camera. Uh, or actually, dark means that, I guess, in this case. Um, okay, so normally um, <coughs> normally it's black. So anyways, that's, that's what's going on there. All right, so <clears throat> at least we have a way of visualizing depth. Then we have uh, KD. So I just colored everything purple. I thought that would be fun. And then this is our, our diffuse roughness which I can, I can change that. Um, I could basically say it's really rough or it's not. So we're going to use that when we talk about Oranair. And KS is our, uh, I just have it set to reflect white because uh, we're shining a white light on everything. KS is the roughness for the, so how rough is our uh, surface for reflection purposes? <coughs> this represents which um, uh, cube map we would be looking in. All right, so if it's green, it would be looking uh, up. And if it's, uh, 
and I use complementary colors to these to represent the other angles. But you know, if we look at this, we can almost like it almost looks like we're inside of a box that is is got these solid colors, right? So <clears throat> because I, I spent the time making sure that these look correct, then I know that if I were to put a cube map on here, it's going to reflect the environment correctly. Okay, this is why you want to debug all this stuff up front because if you don't debug it, then if it's pointing backwards or you won't even catch it. Uh, it's, so you want to debug this stuff early on. Okay, <clears throat> now, Lambertian. Okay, so this is our uh, Lambertian N.L lighting. Okay, so this is basically just, uh, you know, I guess we could change the direction of the, of the light uh, going around <laughs> and we could have the sun going up and down through the day. Now what I did here for this particular one is that when the sky, uh, I actually use it to color the, the background as well, but you know, it makes sense that when the sun goes down, you have very little light and it goes down to zero. And, and when the sun is up, then we, ha we have the same effect. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll just stick this back at 70 and we'll stick the sun back over here at zero. So let's take a look at what Air does. So we're gonna do, go back. <clears throat> this is our diffuse model. And so if I were to adjust the roughness, we'll notice that it, everything gets a little bit darker. And actually, let me turn this light off. So that should be easier to see. So when I adjust this roughness, you'll, you'll notice, and I guess I should zoom in here. Okay. It, it kind of gives it this dusty appearance. So if I were to rotate, everything doesn't, it, it gets rid of that, sh <coughs> it gets rid of that shine. And, and the, uh, the other element here, let me uh, swing the, the sun around. The other element is that you notice now it looks flat. So if I were to go back and forth between the Lambertian model and the diffuse model, you'll notice that we got rid of that dark fall off on the sides. <coughs> okay, so um, that is the that is the Oranair model. So we can go back down to zero and up to one. So you can tell that it, it makes a difference uh, with the reflection. And so I like to say that it gives objects a dusty appearance. So when I look at it, I just, I, I perceive it as being kind of dusty. And, and I think it makes sense because they were looking at reflection of the moon as, as one of their inspirations or at like clay pots. And if you've ever touched a clay pot that hasn't been glazed, you touch it and you're like, you know, it, your hands feel like you like got all this fine particles and so on. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay, <clears throat> um, now well, I did mention that we were, we, you should do your color, cal you should do your calculations in linear space versus log space, okay? So inside the shader <coughs> at the very end, I am actually, um, you know, when we get to the Lambertian model, I basically turn on, <coughs> uh, I turn on, the gamma correction, right? So if our gamma is 2.2, we're basically taking the power of, we take the color and raise it to the power of one over gamma, okay? So 2.2 is typically considered to be like your monitor, all right? But if I had set it to 1.0, right? Clear, we'll do no gamma correction. <coughs> then uh, when I go, when I go out here, uh, I guess for one, it's really dark. Um, but the other element is that, you know, when I apply something like, uh, let's, let's bump that uh, number up. Let's, let's increase the power or the, I'm just going to scale all the colors up by two. Okay. Diffuse color. You, you notice everything's dark, you know, everything feels really dark and, <laughs> but some color, yeah, some areas are really light. And this is because your your monitor and your eyes are not perceiving linear brightness. So we have to basically scale it back down 
because when you basically set say 255 on your on your on your pixel it's not it's not like one two fifty sixth of the brightness of white as you go up from two fifty four. It's actually a lot brighter than that. So you have to gamma correct by squashing the numbers back down. <coughs> okay. So if we do if we do this, then uh, we'll we'll set the gamma back to one. I'll throw this over here, uh, on the diffuse side. Okay. So there's our gamma is one. And if we, if we go up to 1.5, this is gonna start scaling our dark colors so that, so that they become a little brighter, All right? So we can tell that the, the colors are getting brighter. There's not as much difference. We're basically perceiving black to white is a smooth scale, okay? And if we go up to something ridiculous like three, uh, we're starting to, to compress the, uh, we're starting to compress <coughs> our colors, right? So that they go from black to, to, to bright almost instantaneously. So this is too much gamma correction. Um, and so I'm just gonna go back to 2.2. <coughs> okay, which is just about right for your monitor. That most people, that's how they're, we're gonna perceive this, okay? Okay, so that's, that's the diffuse. Uh, but there's one more diffuse model I want to talk to you about, and, and that's the Disney. Uh, so we've been talking about physically based uh, calculations. This one is not, uh, it doesn't conserve energy. <coughs> um, but it's, it's, it's been used in production uh, by Disney, and it kind of gives an objects a fuzzy or velvety appearance. Okay, so Ordinaire, like I said, it makes everything look dusty, like, like somehow you want to reach into your monitor and just get a feather duster and clean it up. Right, it just doesn't look right. Uh, so what this one does is this tries to use the um, Fresnel to, <coughs> in both directions, the going towards the light and going towards the viewer, and it tries to use the uh, Fresnel as a way of compensating for the the brightness uh, loss that happens at the edges of objects. So if you were to look at somebody's hair or if somebody was wearing like a fuzzy jacket and, and there was a light shining behind them, chances are on those edges, you don't, it doesn't go to zero. It, you have this bright Fresnel effect that happens, okay? So <clears throat> when, when we implement, <coughs> sorry, I'm talking too fast. So when we uh, uh, implement this one in our shader and uh, I, I have a technique I like to do where I just use a negative, I, I basically just let the roughness go from minus one to positive one, and I use the negative numbers to switch the models. So uh, over here, um, I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in, and we're gonna go, this is air, so looking kind of dusty, but if I go the other way, <coughs> this is using the Disney one, and, and you'll notice that, you know, depending on the angle, that you get these bright highlights, uh, for instance, right, right there, it kind of looks velvety, you know, it looks fuzzy. So if we go back and forth between, uh, you'll notice it now it just looks kind of dusty. And uh, now we can kind of bring in some of that, that brightness, that retro reflection. <coughs> so in this case, uh, the, the only problem with the Disney one is, is it's not physically based. In, in other words, it's not really conserving energy, but uh, this is one of those you just, you put it in your bag of tricks because I tell you what, if you, if you have this inside your game, then like, you know, you can make clothes look better, make a whole bunch of other things look better that you don't want the regular diffuse uh, look to, okay? So <coughs> this is a, a great technique. Uh, the Disney uh, diffuse one is a great technique to, to kind of add a little, um, sh oops, a little bit of sheen to your graphics. So Disney is pretty cool. <clears throat> okay, so um, the next the next part we're going to start to talk about is micro facet models, and we've kind of talked about these a little bit in terms of you know you have the surface which we're treating as flat, but the micro facets, <coughs> you know, since nothing is really perfectly smooth, um, we have a way of modeling what the underlying surface looks like, okay? And there's a couple of ways to do that. One is with a Gaussian model where you just assume that every facet is not really connected to each other, but it represents a, a random orientation. And most of the time, if, you, if you're using a Gaussian distribution, 
what you're saying is that most of the time the facets actually point towards the normal. But as you, as you, but a few of them start to point away from the normal. And, and the rougher that it gets, the rougher the, the, uh, the microsurface uh, is, then the more they, they tend to face away from the normal, okay? So <clears throat> the, the important uh, concept here is that the projected area needs to be conserved, all right? We'll talk about projected area, uh, maybe not today, um, but it's, it's, an, and it's another test we can apply to our physically based model to see if we're on the right track. <clears throat> So in order to do a specular BRDF, we need another equation, okay? So we, we looked at the diffuse equations, they look very different, but generally we're starting as a, uh, from constant reflection because we're assuming that it's isotropic uh, scattering. And so with this particular one, <coughs> um, we are going to use uh, three different equations here. So one is the micro facet distribution this one says, if I'm, if I'm pointed towards the, uh, uh, the half angle, roughly how many of the normals are, are pointed in the direction I'm looking at, okay? So as you get towards uh, incidence, you, get most of the, you should get most of the micro facets pointing in that direction. And as you move towards <coughs> um, incident, then you should get almost none or very few because it's very, you know, as you're pointing like perpendicular, doesn't matter what direction that they're facing, you wouldn't see it anyways. <clears throat> now, then we got the Fresnel factor, which says how much of light is even reflected in this direction to begin with, okay? So Fresnel is, is the reason why you can see into the water and sometimes you get a reflection. So it's an, it's an important part of making your uh, shininess look correct. And we'll see that today um, <clears throat> because we're not using Fresnel right now, okay? And, and so, We'll see what happens when you just kind of do the bare, bare basic, okay? We assume there's no Fresnel, and we also assume that there's no masking or shadowing. And what masking and shadowing means is that if we have uh, the microsurfaces at different angles, then clearly as light's shining on it, it's going to shadow other parts of the microsurface. And so if we ignore the masking shadowing function, which is common, and if you ignore the micro fast, well, we're not, if you ignore the Fresnel, then you get the, the majority of the effects, okay? <clears throat> and then in order to, uh, you know, make it physically based, and we divide by four times uh, the cosine of theta I and theta O, which are incoming and outgoing angles. So if you remember the parallelograms uh, or parallelopipeds, more or less kind of saying, here's how much light should be coming for the view, and here's how much should be coming to the L. We put those together, it more or less tells us how much light is going to actually be traveling in the reflection. It kind of gives us a bound for that. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> so let's talk about the first one for now, because this is one of the easiest ones to add to the whole equation. <clears throat> so this is going to determine either transmission or refraction. And so we use the term interface to, to, to uh, call the point where the index of refraction changes. Okay, so if you remember physics, you have this flat plane, <coughs> you have a vector going uh, to the interface and then it bends, right? And that's how you learn about for, uh, for now. <coughs> so there's a very common approximation called Schlick's approximation that says if you, if you happen to know what the Fresnel reflection is at zero degrees, in other words, when the light is shining straight on the object, then if you um, add one minus F naught times one minus um, cosine theta D to the fifth, that's the angle between the, the, uh, the half angle and the light direction, then you can figure out how much light is reflecting uh, due to Fresnel. <coughs> so, and essentially I said glancing angles reflect almost 100%. All right, so in other words, you see, you see very little reflection um, when you're looking straight on and you get most of the reflection as you come down towards the horizon, <laughs> okay? Now, um, the micro facet distribution, and we're, we're just gonna like narrow in here on, on the fong and the blind fong, but the, the uh, micro facet distribution, uh, you know, we, Fong is probably the, one of the most popular ones to learn about initially because it's so easy. So you have omega O times omega R. <laughs> this is the 
the light reflected around the normal, not the camera reflected around the normal. And if we just raise that to an exponent, which we calculated with uh, two over m squared minus two, then we can get a shininess uh, associated with it. The, the next one is the Blin Fong. So Jim Blin came along and, and made improvements to the Fong distribution by using a, a Gaussian. And so there's a, uh, it's called normalized Blin Fong. And so alpha squared represents the roughness. And so <laughs> if you have a, if you basically were doing the same thing, but we're, instead of calculating um, omega G dot omega R, we're doing omega, this is a typo. Uh, we're doing omega G dot omega H. So instead of doing the reflectance of the light around the normal, we're doing it around the half angle. And we're basically just raising this to a power. <clears throat> okay, so E and this, this value over here is the same, is the same thing. Okay, and we're gonna, we're not, we don't have time to talk about GGX today, but we'll talk about it on Monday. Okay, but let's take a look. Um, let's take a look at adding Fong in to our shader. So over here we have Fong. So this is give us our, uh, now we can like reflect light. And so now it's like, wow, this is, uh, we got some shiny surfaces here. <coughs> uh, Fong has a tendency to look plastic, plastic. <laughs> All right, and uh, <clears throat> if we turn up our, if we turn up the, the reflectance here, you know, it, it can really look plastic. Depends how shiny it is, right? It depends how much, if you got a McDonald's toy or, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, but it's also, uh, as you get towards glancing it, there, there's uh, some issues with it, all right? But this is uh, this is the Fong model. Now, the <coughs> the Blin model, the Blin Fong model. Uh, you'll notice that we, we can uh, we can approximate them a little bit better. But if you notice, this has some errors associated with it. So if you're if you're looking, you'll notice that the the way that the light reflects is a different shape. It's more of an elliptical shape rather than a spherical shape. All right. So if I were to actually look on the bottom. Uh, I think I have to zoom out here. If if I were, um, <coughs> there we go. Let's try to make this shiny. Okay. So if I were if I were reflecting this light on this on this object here, you'll notice as as I get smaller and smaller, it, it turns into a, a circle. But you notice that it's a circle no matter which way I look at it. But if I go with uh, Blin Fong, you'll notice it's not a circle anymore. It's actually an ellipse. And that, as if I were to look at a surface going out, um, let me see if I can if I can approximate that. I don't know if I can. I cannot do that right now. Um, <clears throat> what ends up happening is that the reflection starts to elongate, which is what you would expect. Whereas Fong is like this perfect circle that doesn't go away. <laughs> and so because of that, the the Fong is not physically based. Um, you can kind of see here blend Fong versus regular Fong, so circular and elliptical. And, and that's the main, you know, so from a practical perspective, they're both about the same amount of processing power. Um, but with Blin Fong, you can still get that plastic look, uh, but it's technically more correct. Okay, so I'll let that rotate around. Uh, that's all we have for today. Um, this, you know, we basically went from flat dull objects uh, to, uh, shiny objects, and then we can also uh, control. <coughs> we, we can also control, you know, the diffuse. So if we were, you basically can use the both the effects at the same time, and uh, you know, so if it's not reflecting, and you can kind of describe its appearance if it's just with the diffuse reflection. Okay, so this is how you basically, you know, from a a rendering perspective. Um, <coughs> It's hard to get these uh, single faceted objects to, to work for you. But yeah, that's <clears throat> those are the equations that we apply. And we're going to take a look more at the specular side of things come Monday and really kind of dig into GGX. <coughs> and, um, and when we do that, we'll also uh, <coughs> go over the review for the final. And not the final, but the midterm. So we'll uh, get an idea of everything that you should know. But uh, you should start taking a look at the slides and you really need to memorize the rendering equation, the BRDFs, uh, 
uh, well, the, the, a few of the BRDFs, not all of them, memorize the, you know, six parts of the, of the Renner equation and, and memorize the, um, the rules for uh, being physically based, you know, positivity, the Helmholtz reciprocity, which is the, uh, if you flip the angles and then uh, conservation of energy. Okay, those are things that you have to know. So <clears throat> my suggestion is just write them everywhere you go. Uh, I remember I was at Legoland one time and, and uh, they had a wall there. And so I actually was like, yeah, I'm gonna put the rendering equation up here. So I made the rendering equation in Lego uh, <laughs> on the wall there, just because I'm a crazy weird graphics guy, but that's just kind of me. So uh, anyways, if you have any questions, you know, please let me know. But uh, hopefully we've enjoyed getting from like this kind of stuff, uh, normals to actually having shiny objects that we can do something with. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, the streaming here.